Hey everybody, back with the case study. So let's dive right into our dive injury case study. So as a recap, you were dispatched to your local lake for an unconscious 48-year-old female who you advised began swimming erratically after coming up from a dive. She was assisted into a boat and brought to the shore. There she's found in a full wetsuit with shallow respirations and unconscious. Other divers state that she seemed in distress as she surfaced from the water very quickly. Her GCS is three, she has a patent airway, breathing shallow about 15 times a minute. Her skin is pale and wet. Pupils are perla, heart rate's 104 with a blood glucose of 36. Blood pressure is 106 over 70, and her SpO2 is 90% on room air. So what did you come up with for a differential diagnosis? With that, what would be your treatment plan for each differential diagnosis? And what, if any, situation-specific questions will you ask? Okay, so let's do a little review on this. As a lot of you are picking up, yes, a decompression illness or injury or syndrome, kind of that latter word is used interchangeably. So we're going to go with decompression illness. Okay, so that kind of branches out into two different things of barotrauma, or an actual decompression sickness, more commonly known as the bends. As a recap before we dive into this, some little basic review things. So the concentration of air that we breathe in is mixed up of multiple gases. Mostly in the air is nitrogen. The second of that is oxygen. So atmospheric air we generally breathe in is 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and miscellaneous of various little things of 1%. As we breathe in that oxygen, nitrogen, those miscellaneous gases, the oxygen and nitrogen circulate into our tissues. So yes, oxygen, nitrogen goes in throughout our body. And one of the most biggest fundamental things we need to understand when it comes to dive injuries is the concept of Boyle's Law. So what this relates to is outside pressure has a direct correlation to the volume of gases. So if you can see here in the little animation, so at right at the surface, if you had a balloon, and then you start pulling that balloon down, as you go down, that pressure becomes greater. Okay, so all those molecules of gas are compressed smaller. So imagine that balloon being that volume of gas. As it goes deeper, the volume is compressed by that increase of pressure from the outside. So diving in water, and granted, all this is based on no change in temperature. So if you change temperature, that correlates a little bit different, but that's a whole nother side topic and very, very deep stuff for um, beyond recreational diving. Okay, so about every 10 feet or 33 meters you go, your pressure is going up by one atmospheric or one bar. So then the opposite of that. So imagine if that small balloon surfaces, it's going to start to increase fourfold. So if you look in a far right column of that, that's where you're starting to see how that really affects on the lungs. So going down deeper pressure increases the pressure on that lung, is decreasing that volume. Okay, so this is going fast. So in the dive world, we're always taught that we go and equalize. So if you've ever traveled, been on a plane, you've probably felt your ears pop, or even just going on a car, up mountains and down mountains. So you try to equalize. Divers will do the same thing, just trying to equalize the pressure. So your body is fine with all that, as long as you're not going down too fast or up too fast. So your body can compensate for the size of those air molecules going throughout your body. So decompression sickness, let's talk about that and what the actual problem with that is. So is that oxygen and nitrogen circulate into our tissues. Okay, so the volume of our tissues is, or the capacity that our tissues can hold depends on the size of the volume of those gases. So just like in a little picture drawn here. Same size of tissue, just at different pressures. So at that higher pressure, smaller gas volume. So what ends up happening in the bins is 
larger air molecules get trapped in that muscle from going up. So that volume of molecules that are occupying in that space will start to expand and get bigger, bigger, bigger. So imagine those old analogies of trying to guess how many marbles are in that jar. But then if you change elevation of where that jar is, depends on how the size of those marbles change. So that's what causes the bends. Those molecules will stay in the tissues or in the joints, become very painful as they expand and basically make you stay bent over. So that's where the term bends comes from. Is a patient in extreme pain causing everything to be bent? So the decompression syndrome on us some symptoms. So it's basically broken to, to two different types. Type one is all musculoskeletal and skin issues. That's we're gonna have those patients having the bends, having the joint pain, having that petechiae from blood vessels starting to rupture in the skin, causing that blood rash, that petechiae, or itchy skin. At type 2, this is where it gets more serious. This is the neurological symptoms. So that's where those bubbles can actually lodge into the spinal cord, get into the nerves, and cause a whole variety of neurological things, such as dizziness, weakness, numbness, that abnormal gait, loss of sensation, um, the same thing in pressure into the ears. If you end up getting that pressure into the ears, like we've experienced with having to equalized pressure in our ears from being on a plane or traveling up and down different elevations, all those same inner ear things can cause a lot of those like the vertigo, unsteady gaits, dizziness, overall ear pain, or tinnitus, like that ringing in the ear. So all those are developed at type two classifications. Now we'll move on to decompression injury, diving a little bit more into, yes, pun intended, diving into more of what's going on in our scenario. So with the decompression injury, the problem relates to the same thing. So is that oxygen and nitrogen go into the tissues? The tissue capacity, again, depends on the size of the volume of the gases, no matter what the tissue is, whether it's muscle, in the alveoli, lungs, blood vessels, wherever. So now high pressure, smaller gas volume. But what starts to happen is mostly in that rapid ascending is where the biggest issues are going to happen. So from that diver who's went up and held their breath or just went too fast and didn't give their body chances to equalize and hash out the balances between, um, you know, a larger bubble being replaced by a smaller one or vice versa, occupying too much space. So that rapid ascend, gas volume, is greater than that tissue capacity, so it will rupture that tissue. Whether that's in the lungs, like that analogy of the deflated balloon that rises, those lungs expand and can pop. And the same thing at the alveolar level. So the alveolar level, just a single alveoli could pop, or ultimately into the blood vessels, because if those, um, as oxygen and everything's traveling through there, it's going to be changing sizes as well. And then ultimately the big issue with that is what's known as an arterial gas embolism. So the problem with that is that ruptured tissue, those air bubbles enter the bloodstream and cause an embolism. So the severity of that is going to depend on the size of that air embolism and then underlying factors. Like in the picture before, if they have any type of um, you know, thick and placked walls, it's not going to take as big of a air emboli to cause a complete blockage. Um, they're going to lodge just as any embolism would. So we've heard of pulmonary embolisms of that blood clot sticking in the lungs. Well, this can be an embolism anywhere. So it can be on the pulmonary side, coronary vessels, or cerebral. So we could have those uh, pulmonary embolism from an air bubble. We could have coronary, so we could get a clot in the heart. So same thing as like a patient having a STEMI, essentially, that there's a blockage and no blood flow is going to get past that bubble or cerebral. So they could have a stroke. So ultimately, the treatment is treating 
airway, breathing, circulation, just as if it is a clot anywhere else. With the exception of going to give them an increased level of oxygen. So high flow oxygenation, increasing that fraction of inspired oxygen, trying to wash out all those inert gases. So those nitrogen bubbles, high levels of oxygen, 100% oxygen, trying to wash out that 78% nitrogen. Then ultimately getting them to a barometric chamber and or a trauma center, depending on what's going on with them specifically. Now, a lot of trauma centers do have those barometric chambers, but that's one of those things you've got to coordinate out of exactly possibly what's going on with them, their symptoms. Is it just the bends or have they had a, um, do they have a pneumothorax from popping that lung by sending too quickly? So thanks for joining everybody. Quick overview. So remember, support airway, breathing, circulation, where we're gonna have the biggest issues is with divers who ascend too quickly. So as divers have went up, didn't wait at a certain level to try to equalize before they continued to ascend, developing those large air emboli, um, whether that's in some type of pulmonary tissue, cardiac tissue, vascular tissue, and what type of symptoms that's going to cause. A lot of these symptoms are gonna be kicking out um, the severe ones, like the embolisms, you're going to see those within the first few minutes of the patient surfacing. The bends, those symptoms can occur within 24 hours. Sometimes they can resolve on their own, but ultimately, any divers coming up having some type of weird neurological or pulmonary issues, start thinking that it is a dive injury related to Boyle's Law disrupting homeostasis. Till next time, I'll see you around.